into the water and see if I could see any fish. Yeah. So what are we what are we thinking today? I wish I could use this arm. So what happened to your wrist, Norm? I, I was working in my garden. I fell on it and broke both the uh, ulnar and the radius bone. Both bones are broken in it. It's going to be another six weeks, six or eight weeks until they heal up and I can actually do things well again. Yeah. I can't really make a cast without it. One, one arm fly casting doesn't work. So your cast on your wrist is hindering your cast. Fishing. It is, yes. <laughs> I just brought this as a prop, really. We'll see. We'll see. You can show Max what's going on, too. So we're here at um, Blind Pass Beach, and as far as snook fishing, this is a pretty good place. This is one of the best snook fishing places in the world. And what makes it one of the best places in the world to fish for snook? It connects the Gulf of Mexico with Pine Island Sound. And Pine Island Sound is one of the most productive game fish nurseries in the world. Lots of snook and other species. Mm -hmm. And the Gulf of Mexico, of course, in the summertime especially, is full of game fish of all kinds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do the intro. Let's keep walking. And, um, Did we get so. to the yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Shellcast, the award-winning podcast that's a beach break for your ears. Listen along as we discover the best of Southwest Florida. We're here in Lee County, and we're along the coastline of the Gulf of Mexico, about two hours south of Tampa. And you heard that right. Shellcast is an award winner. We just found out that Shellcast won a Flagler Award from Visit Florida for creativity in public relations and social media marketing. Visit Florida is the state's official tourism agency. We here at Shellcast are thrilled that the podcast promoting the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel has received this recognition, and thank you all for listening. I'm your host, Jackie Parker, and I work for the Lee County Visitor and Convention Bureau. And today we're at beautiful Blind Pass Beach doing some fly fishing with legendary fly fisherman Norm Ziegler. Norm, thank you for um, coming out here and just showing us and talking to us about um, about fly fishing and why it's so special here in Southwest Florida. Thank well, you're you. welcome. I have, happen to have a tremendous love for fly fishing and for passing it on, teaching it to other people. When it comes to the information about fly fishing, I do not believe in secrets. <laughs> I'll tell people the secrets in the secret spots so they can catch their fish. And the cool thing about Blind Pass is it is um, on the way to Captiva. There's a bridge here that, that takes people over the Blind Pass, quite literally. And it is, it's shallow here. And what makes it good for snook fish? It has so many currents to meet each other and swirl around. And it brings the bait fish to eat their, their little copepods and so forth. And then the game fish come after the bait fish. So that sometimes this place is like it's a circus with fish jumping all over and feeding. Mm -hmm. And we're out here looking out on the Gulf of Mexico. At, we're here at high noon. And midday is a good day for fishing. For snook, the high bright sun is a wonderful condition. And that's very unusual. Most of the fish are very sun shy and they won't come in close when the sun is up. Because normally you don't see many people fishing from the beach. They're usually out in boats. So this is different. This Actually, this from here to down another three miles to Bowman's Beach is one of the best known game fish stretchers in all of Florida, hence in all the world. All kinds of fish are here. We could see some. The water is partially clear. So we might see a fish or two going by. We're seeing a lot of people out here swimming. One cautionary note for people. On the Sanibel side of Blind Pass, the waters are, are quieter and more serene. So right now we're looking for a spot. What are we doing? We're just looking for fish. Okay. I'm expecting we, we didn't have so many people here. We could see some. <laughs> We're 
fishing here, almost anywhere, have a good pair of polarized glasses because that enables you to see the fish in the water. Mm -hmm. If your glasses are not polarized, you will not see them. Mm -hmm. This happens to be one of the most beautiful beaches in the world too, which goes really the whole length of Sanibel, 12 miles. And I compare it to some of the beaches in Greece, and Spain, and Portugal. It can hold its own against any of those. Mm -hmm. like, you were a, a former, you were a journalist with Stars and Stripes. Yeah, that's so right. You, you were over there, you, you've been an outdoor writer pretty much your entire writing career. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I was on the news desk though for eight years. Then it was the travel and outdoor writer for seven. And writing about the outdoors, fishing and hunting, is just as much fun as doing it because you get to relive it. That's right. And to get a little way away from the people, we have a better chance of seeing the fish. You guys both need stripping baskets. I don't use a stripping basket. I, I forgot mine. I, had, I would if I had them, but if you if you stand out of the water, I haven't really found I need it too much. Well, if you get sand on your line and get it into your reel, you're gonna wish you had one. Yeah. Stripping basket is that green thing that Libby was carrying with uh -huh. it's yeah. around here. Yeah. And you strip some extra line into it, maybe 30 or 40 feet. And so you can make a thick cast if you see a fish. And it protects your line from the sand, fog and sand. Because mm -hmm. we're not fishing in the water. If we tried to fish in the water for the snook, we would be stepping on them some of the time. And that's why you were saying, keep your feet, keep your feet dry. Keep your feet dry, yes. Because you don't want to be out in the water with them because that's going to scare them away. It is. All right. Now there are exceptions where you want to wade out. Once in a while there'll be a sand flat out here. Uh-huh. You want to wade out through it. Because, you know, when you talk about fly fishing, most people think of, you know, being out in big sky country out in Montana and right. you know, with the hip waders and everything. And this is this is southwest Florida fly fishing. It is, and it's some of the best in the world right here on Sanibel. And with with snook, there are only a few months out of the year that you can fish for snook. On the beach. Right. But the rest of the year we fish for them in the mangroves and and we catch lots of them that way too. The sight fishing is my thing though. And that happens oh May through the end of November. Mm -hmm. We do get the big ones. Let's see if Tim I'd like to see Tim hook up. See, he's got his line that's being caught by the waves. Mm -hmm. He had a stripping basket. He'd be stripping the line into the basket. He wouldn't have that problem. Oh, okay. Now, the only advice I would give Tim is don't bend your wrist so much. Uh -huh. Two ways to lose power in your cast is to bend your wrist or to come back too far in the cast. What was it that got you into fly fishing? Well, I was an avid outdoors kid, collecting turtles and snails and snakes and fishing and hunting with my dad and so forth. But when I would read Field of Stream and Outdoor Life, I would read stories about fish, fly fishing for trout in New Zealand, uh, Ted Williams going up to New Brunswick and catching Atlantic salmon. And I said, boy, that really sounds like it for me. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was a kid, I didn't have the money to buy a fly fishing outfit. Mm -hmm. But after college, I did get one. Now, we could walk the whole way to Bowman's, but we don't want to. I read somewhere that snook fish one of their nicknames is soapfish? That's right. If you, people used to eat a lot of snook. Fortunately, the uh, limits have been really tightened down. 
But if you eat it and cook a snook fillet with the skin on, that's where they kind of get that name. It tastes a little bit like soap. <laughs> Once you take the skin off, it's one of the best eating fish in the world. But they are, they really are regulated. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, you're only allowed to keep one a day, and that has to be between 28 and 33 inches. <laughs> you got a weighted fly on, Max? No, I have one of the stands deceivers. I was working in the refuge this morning. Yeah. I'd put a Schminnow on here, though. Yeah. It's just a little overcast, but there's, you know, there's plenty of light. There's plenty, plenty of light to see in, to see if the snook are out there. The water is a tiny bit off color. If it's crystal clear, you can see them sometimes 40 or 50 feet out. Mm -hmm. Go along just a little bit more in there. This is my first year being semi handicapped. I'd walk five or six miles a day every time I went to snook fishing. Yeah. Before, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a long way to go. Yeah. So can we, can we talk about um, what's, what's going on with your health right now? Absolutely, yeah. I found out about 14 months ago that I have Parkinson's disease, which has strongly affected my balance, and I've taken some falls. And one of the falls I took injured my wrist. I broke my wrist. And I, you can't cast a fly rod with one wrist. So that's why I'm not fishing today. You're more here as an advisor today, I think, with, right. with Max and Tim. Yeah. <laughs> so there's you know a mix of people out here fishing, and there are people out here swimming. That's right. So just some things for the, the fishermen to be aware of, just, you know, sort of knowing where you are and knowing where the swimmers are. Right, and watch watch for the currents, that you don't get ca caught up in one of the rip currents. Like I said, they're usually not on this side, but mm -hmm. occasionally they are. And people get caught in one if, if they've never experienced a rip current. Just let it take you along, and eventually it runs out and you can swim to shore. So you, you've said that, that women and men you know, equally are, are good fly fishermen. And yeah. what's the key? Uh, the key is timing and rhythm. And lots of times women will learn it quicker. Number one, they listen. And number two, they're not trying to overpower the cast. Mm -hmm. Not much of a strength factor in fly casting. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to learn how to fly fish? Well, when people buy a fly outfit from me, I give them an hour. That's enough time for them to learn how to cast, retrieve the, the uh, fly, and catch a fish. So, and the rest takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. But to begin and be able to go fishing, it's about an hour. Mm -hmm. If you have an instructor who knows how to do it. Of the equipment you use here, the best size is an eight weight, nine foot fly rod. What? Almost everyone uses an eight weight, and it's for all the fish we catch here except the big, big tarp, and then we need a 12 weight. You need a 12 weight? Yes. The eight weight is the most versatile for everything else. I've taken several falls on the beach. One I fell, and this big guy came running over to me and put his arms around me 
and put his hands in front and yanked me up from the, from the ground. And then when I got home, I would take a deep breath and I could hear a click, click. He had broken one of my ribs. Broke your ribs, yeah, from helping you up. Yeah. Oh. When did that happen? Oh, about two months ago. Yeah. And now we're going to meet Norm's wife, Libby Grimm, and learn a little bit about the Schmino lure. Libby, I want to talk to you. Sure, Jackie. Just about, yeah. about you know, being out here and what makes this place so special for you and Norm oh. and, and a little, you know, about your store and um, just the, yeah, whole, the whole thing. Uh, gosh, well, <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Norm, did you have a chance to tell Jackie how we ended up on Sanibel? Did you mention the reason how he came here? No, that's in the book. Well, I want to tell you everything. It is in the book, gosh. Well, there there was a reason we ended up here, and it ended up being a great place. It was maybe going to be temporary to stay in San Bell, and we decided to stay. And for many years, Norm wrote his books in German and English, and our, our, our magazine articles and books in English, and uh, developed the Schmino. You know, just happened to create the famous Schmino, Norm's Crystal Schmino, the fly that made it so little kids could tie it, and anyone could tie it. He copyrighted the name, but of course, anyone can tie the fly. And it was for Snook which I call his girlfriend, you know, because the big giant ones are only female. <laughs> they change sex. And then it ended up catching 69 other species all over the world, freshwater and saltwater. 70 in, now. In, is it up to 70? Is it up now. to 70 now? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a, a schminnow. It's a cross between shrimp and minnow? Exactly, yeah. And I spelled it the German way because we lived there 15 years. And you created this fly. I did. Tell me about it. Okay, so we're going to describe it. It's it's, it's white uh, and it's made out of chenille. Crystal shin, crystal pearl, crystal white chenille, and it has black monofilament eyes. About how long is it? It's about. It's an, about two and a half inches. Two and a half inches. And the tail is marabou, thick marabou, so it pulsates and moves in the water. Marabou moves better than any other fly tying material in the water, so it makes the makes the fly look more alive. Mm -hmm. and the fish are better. And it, it's it. it's white and kind of fluffy, but then when it's in the water, it's wet. That's and right. The tail collapses when you strip it forward. When you pause it, the tail opens up and flutters, and that's what makes it look lively and wounded. That's when the snook will grab it. Because they think it's a wounded fly. They think it's a wounded bait fish. Yep, wounded bait fish. The name fly for saltwater flies is actually a misnomer. They don't imitate insects, they imitate bait fish or crustaceans. We still call them flies, but they're not. So, can you use the fly more than once? You use it till the fish have chewed all the <laughs> materials off it sometimes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's a sturdy fly as long as you tie it properly and put on. And you uh, and you created this in when? Nineteen. Was it ninety five? Ninety five. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a long time. I've watched some YouTube videos of you tying them. Oh and, yes. And everyone says that they're easy to tie and that you know anyone can do it. It's really true. When I do fly tying classes, it's the first fly we tie because, and people tie it and say, wow, fly tying is really easy. Then we go on to something else. <laughs> it's not quite so easy. But having the fly being so easy and so successful for fish is a very unusual thing. And it's, and in that way, it is a good introduction to fishing for people visiting Southwest Florida and coming over to Sanibel and learning how to fish. That yes, it is. It is. It's a, it's a, um, it's it's a, it's a good introduction. You're out on the beach. You don't have to be on a boat, and you don't have to be in the water. And in, in fact, you encourage fishermen not to be in the water. Stay out of the water. Yes. <laughs> because it, it scares the, the, the snook away. So it really is a good, a good way to... And it will catch any fish here. I've caught every kind of fish there is here. With the, with, the, with, the, the with the schminnow. Some of them I haven't intentionally caught. Some of the junk fish, <laughs> the blowfish, you know, or lizard fish. You don't intentionally try to catch a catfish. You catch on it sometimes. Yeah. According to flyfisherpro.com, 
their research is showing that fly fishing popularity is on the rise and that retail sales have increased since the pandemic. People are looking for new challenges and the growth rate of the fly fishing market supports this. And here are a few statistics from 2018 to 2019. The number of people who went fly fishing grew by 100,000 people. 2% of all Americans went fly fishing last year, which is around 7 million people. And here are a few more fly fishing demographics, according to flyfisherpro.com. The fastest growing demographic of fly anglers were Uh, people who identified as Hispanic. In the United States, the number of Hispanic fly fishing participation grew by 10%. How big is the fly fishing industry? In the United States, the fly fishing industry is worth around $750 million. And in 2019, over 7 million people fly fished in the United States. And yes, in Florida, you do need a fishing license to fly fish. I also got a chance to talk to Max Hogue. He is a student from Vermont and is a huge fan of Norm Ziegler and fly fishing. Max Hogue, I'm a senior at Paul Smith College studying fisheries and wildlife sciences, and I'm from Burlington, Vermont. Okay, and you are down here because you are a big fly fishing fan or just all kinds of fishing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just love the fish and uh, I love the fly fish too and this is one of the best places to do it. Uh, I'm friends with Norm, friends with uh, Travis, Norm's son, and I'm working at the shop for this summer. It, 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 it's been nice. Oh, okay. uh, what, um, so, and you're, so you've known Norm how long? How long have we uh, known each other? Two years. Three, four years? You've, you've known Travis three or four, I think. Yeah. I think I've known you for two. Oh, okay. He's been a good, right. right. good man to have in the fly shop. Oh, yeah. Because people no, I, coming to this area, they don't have the expertise they need sometimes. So they need a person experienced to be able to tell them what to do. And as far as fishing goes, how does Max rate? Max rate, uh, B plus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All sounds, right. about, sounds good to me. All right. Good enough. Another, another few years coming down here, you'll be an A plus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And what is it about fly fishing that just does it for you? I think it's just the, the skill of it. Like anyone can go just cast a rod, but you got to have the patience. Patience is a big thing. Just to just put in the time with the fly rod and just the, just the rhythm. You're actually working everything you do with fly fishing. You're working at it and there's so much improvement. You can never be a pro. You can never be perfect. Mm -hmm. Everyone can improve. Mm Is there something that's sort of a misunderstanding about fly fishing when people start it and they're like, oh, I didn't realize, you know, I thought this was going to happen, or is there anything like that, or is it pretty straightforward? Uh, some people don't realize that you have to constantly keep stripping the fly to make it, give it the action so the fish will take it. You can't just crank the reel like you do with a spinning reel. But that stripping the fly is one of the, uh, one of the most fun things, too, because one time you're going to strip it, and it's going to stop dead because the big fish took it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's when you have your—that's when you have the real fun. Mm-hmm. And I was also thinking one reason that Norm opened the shop to, because he's his mission is to make everyone into fly fishermen and women, you know, and <laughs> it's just so wonderful. There's a misconception; they people don't realize there's entry level outfits, really reasonably priced, you know, and. Uh, under two hundred dollars for everything, and that uh, you know you can tie your own flies. And I think people don't realize it's very accessible. Mm-hmm. There's a myth that it, it's not, and it's incredibly accessible. That's yeah, right. it's, yeah. People think they see someone fly casting on TV, and it that just looks impossible. And you take them, I take them across the street to the, the grass, yeah. and show them this two or three basic movements and you look just like those people. It doesn't take long. I also got a chance to speak with outdoor writer Heidi Brandis, who was fly fishing and getting some tips from Norm Ziegler as well. You're out here learning from legendary Norm Ziegler. What's that been like? It has been an incredible experience because he has a wealth of knowledge. And of course, I don't know much about fly fishing. But Tim, uh, my friend who traveled down here from Fort Worth just to learn from Norm, has been a fisherman all his life. He's just never done a lot of fly fishing. 
So his big dream was to come down here and learn from the Norm Ziegler how to fly cast for snook and tarpon and all that kind of stuff. But he got one snook today. Cool. So it's a good start. Cool, cool. And you're in Fort Worth? Uh, yes, Tim lives in Fort Worth and I'm based in Oklahoma City. Cool. So. That's great. And what was it like? Had, you, you hadn't fly fished before, and you're doing this, and but you fish. You know, yes. You're, you're, you're a fisher, fisherman. Fisher woman. Fisher woman. Yeah. Yes. So what was what was it like? I mean, how does it compare? It's it's really different for me. It's very awkward to have that you know leader line that you have to pull while you're casting, and there's it's almost like a dance. And, you know, at first you feel very clumsy, you feel very unsure of yourself until that, the music of that line starts getting into your limbs and then it just, it becomes a dance. I mean, you can feel that leader line against the wind, you can feel it when it kind of kisses the water out there. And I can see why so many people compare it to Zen, you know, the Zen of fly fishing. Mm -hmm. and. It becomes very hypnotic. I don't care if I catch anything. I just, I really enjoy the act of it. It's just the being out here. Yes. Yeah, great. Tim, can I bug you real quick? Huh? Sure. Your Hi. name? Timothy Lozos. You came here to fish with Norm. Uh, I did, I did. Yeah, I to learn a little bit. Um, I've been fly fishing for the last couple of years. I've fished all kinds of fishing my entire life since I got pictures of me in diapers fishing. Uh, Freshwater, saltwater, inshore, offshore, spear fishing, all that. Love it. And fly fishing was kind of the last one I, I picked up, and I always enjoyed the beauty of it. So after reading Norm's, you know, I read Norm's book about snook, and I've always heard about Sanibel, and uh, you know, had the opportunity to come down here, so made it happen, right? And what would you tell someone coming down here, maybe fly fishing for the first time? Your insight. What did you expect? Well. If it's the first time, get uh, you know an hour or so of instruction from a qualified instructor, and it'll save you so much time. Because my my fishing or my my rhythm and my and my motion has gotten a, a lot better just in the last two days, just be, between uh, a few words from from uh, Norm uh, and Max as well. Um, just a few things you can read it on the internet, you can watch YouTube videos, and that in person thing really helps. And then of course. I show you all the good places to fish, which <laughs> is basically the whole island. Yeah. But, you know. Tim, you were talking <laughs> earlier about about the how it all feels, almost like poetic. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, and that's the actually one of the big draws for me. So much different than you know, spinning reel casting or anything like that, because it's not just about the fishing. It's not just about catching the fish. You have a whole. Uh, you have to get your your you have to get your mind and body in in a sink and get that rhythm going. And once you do that, the fishing, the actual landing of the fly, the actual catching the fish, is like almost secondary, you know? Mm -hmm. It just feels like part of the process. So it's a big process, and for my brain, at least, it's a very fun one to go through. What I'm hearing is that it's just, it's peaceful. Yes. It, it's, it really is a peaceful kind of thing. Yeah, yeah it is, and um, it's, it's totally great not to catch any fish, to go out and just have a wonderful day. Mm -hmm. You can try, you can always have working on perfection in your cast and your loops and seeing how they go and just amazed at the beauty of that. And what Norm was saying yesterday, how everything fades away. Because you're so focused on your cast, your stripping, your movement of the fly that you, you, don't, you don't think of anything else. That's right. You, your troubles go away, they do. You don't think about family squabbles, financial troubles, politics, world disasters. You're just looking at the fish and the water, and that's it. And Norm would say it's very zen-like. No, I don't do zen. I mean, well, or, you know, that peacefulness of it. And he um, sometimes would walk, before, or before he got to Parkinson's, five miles without even realizing it. It's literally, you don't even know you're walking that much. And he, uh, that was one reason, 21 years ago in 2000, he and two friends, and one at have passed away, they started the Sanibel Fly Club, which has really, really grown in membership. But it was to help everybody realize what a great time you'll have at some of, one of the world's best saltwater fly fishing places. Is that something that visitors can take advantage of too? Absolutely. Yeah, we started the Sanibel Fly Fishers in my living room 25 years ago with three guys. It was in my living room and two other buddies. And eventually we got to be over 200 people wow. from around southwest Florida, mainly from Cape Coral, North, North Fort Myers, 
Wood Myers Beach, Sanibel, Captiva. And we were very happy to meet new people and share information. And, and you know, we're here on, on Blind Pass Beach, but there, the other beaches of Sanibel are, are, are good, you know, are, the, are worth checking out too. It's, it's really not... all the 12 miles of Gulf shoreline on Sanibel in the summer has lots of fish on it. It does. The um, beaches are public. Sometimes parking is a problem. That's it. But the beaches are public. You you spoke recently about um, four things. Do you remember those four things? One was reading books. My my favorite four things are reading books, writing books, fly casting, and traveling. Traveling. <laughs> that was my four big passions my, my whole life. Traveling. And. And if you could recommend one of your books that people read first, which book would you recommend? I would recommend Rivers of Shadow, Rivers of Sun, which is more a memoir and a travelogue and a history. It's not a straight fishing book. People would just want a straight fishing book for Sanibel, then they buy Snook on a Fly. That has what they need. But if you enjoy reading and learning about other places and cultures, I would say rivers of shadow, rivers of sun. Norm, thank you, thank you very much. We're going to wrap up this episode of Shellcast, but I want to thank uh, the legendary Norm Ziegler of Norm's Fly Shop for giving us an education on fly fishing, uh, something that you really you know, can, can do here on, you know, in southwest Florida. You know, it's a very unique way to you know, enjoy the sport. And we want to thank um, Libby, his wife, and Max, and Tim, and Chris, and Heidi, who are out here fishing with Norm on this beautiful day. It's probably, I don't know, 90, 92, 93 <laughs> degrees, and we're all just... 100% humidity. Okay, that'll do it for this episode of Shellcast. The official podcast of the Beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel is produced by the Lee County Visitor and Convention Bureau in Fort Myers, Florida. My name is Jackie Parker. Thank you very much for listening to Shellcast, and we'll catch you again next time. Consider this your soundtrack to a drive and your car the escape vehicle to the kind of place that feels worlds away but is closer than you think. Because... At the end of the open road, some things are better experienced than explained. Know the feeling on the beaches of Fort Myers and Sanibel.